I'm Ana Cabrera along with Jose Diaz Ballard reporting from New York with our special coverage. Stormy Daniels back on the stand this morning in Donald Trump's hush money trial, facing additional cross examination right now from Trump's attorney about her allegation of a sexual encounter with Trump and a subsequent cover up. NBC's Yasmin Vasugin is outside the courthouse and here with us for the morning, Charles Coleman, civil rights attorney and MSNBC legal analyst, and Temadayo Aganga Williams, former federal prosecutor, former senior investigative counsel for the House January 6th committee. So, Yasmin, take us to inside that courtroom. What's happening right now? Already pretty contentious, to say the least. It seems as if Stormy Daniels is much more prepared this morning than she was um, Tuesday at the start of her testimony then, especially when it came to cross-examination with Susan Necklace. A lot of back and forth at the very get-go. It seemed as if it, it was as contentious as it was the first go around. And what I mean by that is Susan Necklace asking repeatedly, um, was this just about money? Were you just looking for money? And of course, guys, I'm paraphrasing here. And Stormy Daniels repeatedly saying, no, no, I was not. Just to give you kind of color from inside the court, Stormy Daniels wearing a green dress this morning with a black sweater going down to the floor. Um, her hair is down, seeming more relaxed, according to some of our reporters that are inside the courtroom. There is a back and forth going on when it comes to, for instance, the lead up to the payout of the $130,000. And Susan Necklace brings up this moment in which it seems as if Stormy Daniels was angry, quote unquote, furious, as Susan Necklace puts it, about the fact that the money had not been paid out, the negotiated negotiation, uh, negotiated payout had not been cemented as of yet. And we now know, obviously, the former president was trying to delay that, hoping that he would either win and or lose the election and would not have to necessarily pay out this $130,000 towards Stormy Daniels. Stormy then subsequently asked, what are you talking about when Susan Necklace said, weren't you furious? Weren't you angry? Weren't you calling Keith Davidson names, your attorney at the time? And she said, what are you talking about? I'd like to see this evidence. So let me read for you some of what they played for the court today, a conversation between Keith Davidson and Michael Cohen about this, um, guys, in which, and there, by the way, are some expletives there, so I'm going to skip some words. Um, I just didn't want you to get caught off guard. This is Keith Davidson speaking, and I wanted to let you know what was going on behind the scenes, and I would not be the least bit surprised if I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if you see in the next couple of days that Gina Rodriguez's boyfriend, remember Gina Rodriguez is Stormy Daniels' agent at the time, goes out in the media and tells the story that Stormy Daniels, you know, in the weeks prior to the election was basically yelling and screaming and calling me a P word. And you can guess what that word was. And Michael Cohen says, can I can I ask you a question? And Keith David says, no, no, hold on one second. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if he comes out and says, you know what, Stormy Daniels, she wanted this money more than you can ever imagine. I remember hearing her on the phone saying, you blanking Keith Davidson, you better settle this story because if he loses this election, and he's going to lose, if he loses this election, we lose all leverage Leverage in this case. It's worth zero. And if that happens, I'm going to sue you because you lost this opportunity. So settle this blanking case. And then they go on because they bring up, guys, the NDA, right, the settlement, the $130,000, and the point of which there's an exchange between Necklace and Stormy Daniels. And I'm just going to read a bit for you, and then I'm going to throw it back to you because I know there's a lot to talk about here. Um, there's a settlement agreement, Necklace says, between two parties. You cite a few things that will be agreed to. Prior to entering the agreement, there is confidential information relating to the defendant in this case. And Daniel says, yes. The next paragraph that they're looking at, you say you have been damaged and you were going to have it have to release claims. I did this, Stormy Daniel says, because my attorney suggested that I do. And then they go on. This is the parties agreeing it would be kept confidential and you refer to it as an NDA. Yes, this is the confidentiality agreement, right? Necklace says, Daniel says, Yes. Again, this is getting guys, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this in the cross-examination, which is likely to go on for the next couple of hours because they go on. This is getting at the credibility issues of Stormy Daniels. One thing, though, that I will note in some of this cross-examination that we're seeing that I mentioned earlier on is she seems much more prepared. She's droning on less, giving kind of yes or no answers, listening to the questions from Susan Necklace, understanding, right, that Susan Necklace kind of might have some moments that she's going to bear out. And we heard from Donald Trump earlier today, seeming as if there are some moments in which Susan Necklace plans to kind of bear out, play out for Stormy Daniels that could catch her off guard. So she seems more prepared for many of these exchanges going into this, but certainly going to be um, lots of fireworks today um, throughout this cross-examination and then moving on, of course, to redirect. What is, Danny, this line of questioning trying to establish? 
It's trying to establish her knowledge with, of Donald Trump's day-to-day -day activities, how he was involved, whether he was hands-on, whether he was a micromanager. I expect we're going to hear a lot of questioning about uh, how he conducted his day and the business. And really what we're going to get to shortly is how the process went when she would bring checks for him to sign, specifically the Michael Cohen checks that Yasmin showed us on the screen, and that process and how involved he was. And then when we get to cross, I expect that the defense will have to explore uh, whether or not was he distracted? Did he just sign things without looking at them? I imagine the prosecution will sort of pre-butt that in their questioning and try to paint Donald Trump as somebody who is intensely involved at every step. Madeleine Westerhout, by the way, we've just spent a day and a half on Stormy Daniels, right. whose uh, importance in terms of evidence, in my view, is minimal compared to the flashy nature of her testimony. Now we've got a witness that maybe some people have heard of. She may not be on the stand that long, but her her testimony, in my view, is arguably much more critical than the day and a half we just spent on Stormy Daniels. No doubt. I mean, Rebecca, and just now what they're asking her is, uh, you know, how he spent his time. And Westerhout says he spent most of the time when he was there working, reading, going over documents in the dining room. That was really his working office. Mangold, was there an organizational system there? Westerhout, to my understanding, the president knew where things were and he kept things organized. But he did have a lot of papers. I found that he always knew where things were. What does that tell you right there, Rebecca? The prosecution is trying to establish that, to establish that the former president himself was involved in these payments. And so all of this is about connecting him to the documents that he signed, trying to make it clear that he didn't just delegate, that he didn't just sign things without thinking about it or knowing anything, that there was an organization and a system to it. I mean, here it is specifically what you're referring to. The question is, is he the type of person who paid attention to details? Westerhout, in my experience, yes. Mangold, signature practices. Did he use an automated signature or sign by himself? Westerhout, he signed by himself. Did he use a particular type of pen? Sharpies or Pentel felt tip? Did he typically read things before signing them? She says, um, yes. Did Mr. Trump use social media while he was in the White House? Westerhout, he did, yes. Primarily Twitter, now called X. Did Mr. Trump post tweets himself using that Twitter handle? Yes, he did. Danny, once again, this is someone with first-hand knowledge of the president's use of his time down to who and how he used the social media accounts. Clearly, she's saying that he was very on top of that, as he was about every single document. So earlier we learned in just today that these checks would be FedExed overnight to the White House. Now, if I'm the defense, I'm thinking, OK, we've got an angle here. Uh, we can frame this as the president became the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. The guy was busy. This is what the defense is going to try and argue, that when these checks came in, even if he did sign them, he just scribbled them. He wasn't really looking. He wasn't paying attention. That is what the prosecution knows is coming, and that's why they bookended this. We heard the testimony about how the checks got put into the FedEx, how they ended up at the White House. And now we're hearing the other end of that transaction, how Madeleine Westerhout personally takes these checks in, gets them signed, and I expect her testimony is going to be good for the prosecution, or else why would why else would they have called her? And we're going to hear that Donald Trump, when he signed these checks, we're already hearing it, that he did it personally, that he's involved. Maybe if he had questions, he would raise those questions. Maybe we'll hear that kind of testimony. But this is just locking in how the transactions worked to make it increasingly and increasingly less likely that this is something that flew totally under Trump's radar. Rebecca, micromanager is the word that comes to mind when one sees what uh, Westerhouse is describing as to as far as Donald Trump's focus on things. Here's just the line of questioning that's going on right now about his process of tweeting from the at real Donald Trump account. So here's Westerhouse. If Dan Scavino, who was the other person who had access to that account, wasn't available or around, the president would call me in and dictate a tweet to me. And then I would go back to my computer and type it up and print it out and give it back to him so he could go over it. He would dictate it. I would type it up on a computer, print a hard copy, take it back to him for review. 
Then he edited sometimes the hard copy. He would ask to make additional changes, then show it to him. He liked to use exclamation points. But once again, this is someone who looks at every single word, every single period, every single exclamation point. You know, I'm curious what the defense does about this, because in a way, this testimony, unlike Stormy Daniels' testimony, kind of makes him look good. You know, in a certain way, he's involved in his work. He's diligent. He's a hard worker. And, you know, so they obviously have to set up on some level that, you know, this was running below his radar. But they have to do it without undermining their client's sense of ego, which is being built up in this testimony, unlike in Stormy Daniels. Yeah, I mean, someone who, you know, cares about how many exclamation points they're putting in <laughs> on a tweet uh, shows you that maybe your time used and the focus that you used to have on some things over others may be significant. Yeah, I actually take a slightly different view. I think this testimony doesn't make him look that good because, yes, he has attention to detail, but if you're the leader of the free world, I'd rather you spend your time on the Middle East and not whether or not your tweets are in caps or How many, exclamation, uh, exclamation points. points or, you have. And the process, by the way, tweeting is normally just, I take my phone, I tweet. This apparently was paper, print it out, come here, approve. And All it, the while, Middle East going on. I have no idea how that's being addressed. So I guess I'm stepping out of legal analyst and thinking more like... Uh, a regular person who might be on the jury or might be thinking, this is really not how the president should have been spending his time, even if it was attention to detail. But it is important context, and I expect the jury is listening closely, because once again, they've called a witness that gives us a glimpse into a world we never otherwise would have had access to. First, it was the world of the National Enquirer. Then it's the world of Stormy Daniels. Now we're hearing about how a president did his day-to-day -day work, which to me is fascinating no matter what it is, no matter who the president is. Finding that he moved into the side, uh, the dining room to do his business, or that they had to print out tweets to bring to him to approve. I mean, all fascinating, all riveting, and all bad for the defense. You know, I think it is very difficult later for the defense to claim uh, if you know, this witness is to be, uh, is to, the, the testimony of this witness is to be given weight, that this is someone who maybe got a check and just signed it, or one, or two, or three, or four, or monthly checks without thinking about it, when he's looking at what parenthesis to use, there's, and I'm just going to go right back to what we're seeing inside that courtroom right now. Did he have any particular preferences to his posts? Yes, certain words he liked to capitalize, including country, capital C. He liked to use dots for a comma. During the first year, Mangold asks, uh, you were there in 2017, would you describe that as a transition period? Westerhaus, yes. I think the first year of any administration is a transition year, and we did the best work we could for the American people. She continues on to say, we were all trying to learn our way around and do the best work we could for the American people. Um, did he ever miss things is the question that Mangold asks. Westerhout, my understanding is he was all he was attentive to things that were brought to his attention. Did you ever have questions for people at the Trump organization? And, and did they have questions for you? Yes. Mangold, for example, um, what were some of the major issues at the Trump organization in 2017? And who were the people there? Rona Graf. Again, and Rebecca, this is a time for the defense to be seeing what this person who clearly is not, I mean, she worked for the president of the United States. She says that, you know, they were trying to do the best they could for the American people. This is not necessarily uh, a person who, you know, like uh, Stormy Daniels, hates Donald Trump. And yet, if you're the defense, what are you looking at here to rebuttal on. You know, I think the best that the defense can do here is to point out the limit of her knowledge. And actually, as you suggest, her testimony is very detailed and suggests that she has a great deal of knowledge, but nobody knows everything. So the best that they can do is say that they, you know, she wasn't there. She didn't necessarily know exactly what he was aware of when he signed this particular check. And that, you know, is poking holes in her testimony, even if it isn't undermining the general point that she's the woman with the story that led to that six-figure hush money payment, a cover-up, and ultimately the first ever criminal trial in a, an American ex-president came under relentless fire today from Donald Trump's defense team. The composed and rather steely Stormy Daniels was on the stand for 
hours, what felt like days of cross-examination, and then a rather brief redirect when the prosecutors got to go back and talk to her again. Now, the trial for Donald Trump is still underway right now. On the stand as we speak, the ex-president's former assistant. Her name is Madeline Westerhout. She told the jury that Donald Trump played, pay, paid very close attention to his finances, even when he was in the White House. But we begin with Donald Trump's defense team throwing the kitchen sink at Stormy Daniels. They were trying to portray her at times as money grubbing, uh, inconsistent, driven by personal hatred, even rolling out the she's crazy line of attack against her. At one point, attorney Susan Necklace said this, quote, you have a lot of experience making phony stories about sex, to which Daniels replied, quote, wow, that's not how I would put it. The sex in the films is very much real, just like what happened to me in that room. To try to prove that Stormy Daniels profited off of her association with Donald Trump, Trump's defense lawyers pointed out that Stormy sold merchandise, to which Stormy Daniels fired back, quote, not unlike Mr. Trump. Team Trump also suggested that Stormy Daniels opposed Trump politically and wanted to take him down, a line of questioning that comes with a lot of risks for the ex-president's team. As NBC News reports, quote, the defense just spent considerable time trying to prove that Daniels had a political motive for wanting to out Trump's story, that she was trying to hurt his election bid. But wouldn't that bolster the prosecution's argument that Trump had a motive for wanting to silence her? During the prosecution's redirect, the DA's office reminded everyone that Donald Trump is the only person on trial, not Stormy Daniels, bringing up a potentially devastating piece of evidence. They asked Stormy Daniels about an admission by Michael Cohen and Trump in a lawsuit that Donald Trump had reimbursed Cohen the $130,000 for the NDA with Stormy Daniels. Prosecution in this line of argument points out that even if she has made money from her association with Trump, her fame has also come at a very steep price. Stormy Daniels said she has had to deal with an avalanche of threats and deal with legal fees. Prosecutor Susan Hoffinger asked this, quote, on balance, has your publicity been, uh, has publicly telling the truth about Donald Trump been met a net positive or a net negative for your life? Stormy Daniels replied, negative. A defiant Stormy Daniels on the stand on day 14 of the Trump election interference hush money trial is where we begin today with some of our most favorite reporters and friends. With us at the table for the hour, New York Times investigative reporter Suzanne Craig. Also joining us, MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman, plus former executive editor with American Media Inc. and special correspondent for The Hollywood Reporter. Lachlan Cartwright is back, but we will start with my friend and colleague, NBC's Von Hilliard, joining us from outside the courthouse. Von, I read political thrillers, and I kind of hate them, but I kind of love them. But I hate when the tension is so much that reading them makes me feel sick. And reading the transcript and reading the vitriol that was directed at Stormy Daniels, at some points, I had that physical reaction to the aggressiveness with which, I'll just say it, they, they sought to slut shame her. And the slut shaming came in the form of, well, aren't all your you know, adult films fake? I thought she, and again, I have no idea what the jurors were thinking. I have no idea how they experienced her direct examination and therefore no idea how they would have experienced the cross-examination. But as a woman, as someone who's covered the Trump story now for nine years, um, I thought, the disparaging treatment of Stormy Daniels is an exhibit in how class has entered into this trial. Hope Hicks weeping. I think people rushed to bring her a box of tissues. But Stormy Daniels, whose story Trump thought would make people so uncomfortable he paid to keep it quiet, seemed to be treated differently than anybody else. What you saw today inside of that courthouse was a woman owning her story repeatedly for hours owning her story. A former president of the United States hired a defense attorney, Nicole Susan Necklace, and that defense attorney went on the attack against that individual, Stormy Daniels, and tried to undercut her story, tried to extract the idea that there were discrepancies in her story. In every step of the way, Stormy Daniels 
fought back against a suggestion that somehow her story have cha had changed. And she said, look, if I wanted to write a thriller, right, she goes, I would have written a different story. Quote, if that story was untrue, I would have written it to be a lot better. She went on. Susan Nicholas asked her, your story has completely changed, hasn't it? Stormy Daniels replied, no, not at all. You're trying to make me say that it has changed, but it hasn't changed. And let's just start with the fact, Nicole, Donald Trump coming into this trial had repeatedly issued blanket denials about his involvement and in his engagements with Stormy Daniels out of the one photo outside of the one photo op uh, at that golf tournament. But what Stormy Daniels, when she testified, she testified that they had met up the night after with Ben Roethlisberger. She said that they had two to three phone calls for weeks following that 2006 interaction. She said that she was invited to a Trump vodka event in Hollywood in January of 2007. She said that he then invited her to Trump Tower, where they met to talk about her potentially appearing on The Celebrity Apprentice. And ultimately, Donald Trump's attorney today, who was the individual who was allowed to be that voice from him inside of that courtroom, did not question her on a litany of those alleged interactions that she claimed to have had with Donald Trump. Instead, the attorney focused on a couple questions around whether she actually had dinner with Donald Trump on that one night stand in 2006, I questioned her on the 2011 parking lot incident. But by and large, over the course of hours under cross-examination, Stormy Daniels stood by her story. She stood by the fact that she had appeared in 150 porn films. She stood by her need to make money for her and her family. She stood by the allegations she made against the former president of the United States in the current presumptive Republican nominee for the White House in 2024, Nicole. Um, Andrew Weissman, your thoughts? So um, right now, there is one person in that if you look at what happened in that room, per her testimony, there was one person who has testified under oath and been cross-examined aggressively for a full day, if you add in Tuesday and today. Um, the other person has said, said, without any sort of accountability for it, that it didn't happen. But he has not testified to it. This reminds me of the impeachments where, you know, he could have testified. He was happy to not do that. Mm -hmm. So he constantly is trying to avoid any situation where he will be held to account. Trump. Trump is. Yes, sorry. So didn't come in for Mueller, didn't come in for either impeachments, hasn't testified at any of these trials. Um, about this. Um, and so no accountability. The difference in the way she was treated when what she's talking about is a consensual relationship and can think about how she was treated in the last day with David Pecker. He testified he needed immunity because of his because what he was revealing was criminal. It was an effort to, as per his words, intentionally defame people with an agreement with Donald Trump to do that, to intentionally catch and kill an agreement with um, the defendant. That, there's no onslaught. But here, because it's a woman, it's a woman of, of whose, you know, people will not relate to as readily, um, and because of his, his image, um, this is what she undergoes. Um, it's remarkable. Three of us were, you know, could hear her, and I really wish people could hear it and not hear it secondhand mm -hmm. from us. Um, I was so interested today because I wasn't there Tuesday, mm -hmm. and you know, my impression, having seen lots and lots of trials, and I don't, I again, don't know, not speaking for the jury. No. It was kind of a home run. I mean, it, for, who? You know, for for the witness. I mean, oh, in I, what Susan, way? So yes. Susan Necklace was, you know, she did what she had to do. Um, a lot of times, you try different things in cross examination, and they don't all land. Um, there were certain lines of cross that you knew were going to be a given, which is, you know, she said she can speak to the dead, and you know, but she had a good explanation for that. Um, she wants to make money from this. She had a good explanation for that, which is it's not that it didn't, it's, it happened and she wants to make money from it. It's not that it's fake and she right. wanted to make money from it. So much else just fell by the wayside, including, I thought, something that was sort of touching and heartbreaking and shows that the witness is smart, is careful, um, unflappable, where she said, no, don't, you don't understand. All I'm saying about Donald Trump, the worst thing he did is he lied about what happened. Everything else that happened in that room is on me. 
it, my fault. Um, I mean, it was so... Which, which was the heart of her direct testimony, that yeah. I laid there and couldn't figure out between I, me, and myself how I got here. Yeah, but she... It was a moment, though, where she was saying, I am not blaming anyone else. Um, and she, at one point, Susan Necklace was trying to say, well, you, you're a strong, powerful woman. You know, you could have just walked out. And she goes, I'm stronger now. Joining me now, once again, two people who are at the courthouse today, MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice. Harry Littman, great to have you guys here. Thank you. So as I see it, sort of three different things, big things happen today. There's Stormy Daniels cross and redirect. There's the, the sort of hearing about the mistrial, which is really interesting. And then the last witness who does got sworn in and is going to be continuing tomorrow. So let's start with Stormy Daniels. We had her on the stand when last I talked to you, I think on Tuesday, right? Um, Cross today, how did it go? For whom is the question? I think it went really well for the prosecution. And obviously, you do. I do. And the reason is because while there are very small differences in Stormy Daniels' story, look, this was an event that happened in 2006. It's 2024. The fact that Susan Necklace literally went on, I just counted, for seven pages about whether Stormy Daniels was consistent or not about saying whether or not they had dinner is really beside the point. They were nibbling at the margins and at the same time, increasingly making her more sympathetic by attacking her for things that were either socially regressive or the same sort of things that their own client does. For example, as you said in the opening, selling himself. Stormy Daniels was selling merchandise. Donald Trump sells merchandise all the time. In addition to his NFTs and shreds of his suits, he's selling gold sneakers. He's selling Bibles. Stormy Daniels sells a T-shirt that says Team Stormy on it, and they ask her, well, what does that mean? That means anybody who hates Donald Trump, doesn't it? She said, no, it means anybody who basically is on my side. And so the way in which they tried to shame her and exploit minor inconsistencies in her story over a period of years, I thought backfired on them, and if anything, just made her seem all the more determined and resolute in the core details of her story. So when you were here last, you were saying that she was a really interesting witness and very compelling, but also you weren't quite sure what the jury made of her just because she does, you know, her, her, her sort of presentation and her line of work, I think is going to be fairly new to most people. I don't know, but, but in terms of like her, her, what she does for a living and you were sort of trying to mentally model what the jury was thinking. What is your thinking about that after watching today? Yeah, so I, I basically agree with Lisa. Nichols lands a few jabs, but she needs, because of what Trump has insisted on, a knockout punch, and she didn't come close. And But also, just as a matter of technique, the she she did a lot. You, you showed a couple of them of questions that, well, isn't it a fact? And Daniel's cool. He said, no, false, et cetera. So that stopped her in, in her um, tracks. And then this misstep of basically suggesting, well, if you work in adult films, you couldn't possibly be cowed by a 60-year-old billionaire, uh, you know, looming over you. I, I think that really was a, a false note that was offensive. And in general, I got to say, um, I thought cross-examination. You must control. You want the jury looking at you. If anything, Stormy was controlling the dynamic in the room. And you could actually see it from whom the jury was looking at. She parried her effectively. Right, just, then there were sidebars. They should bars. be the wall that you're hitting the ball They're against, just like, right? yes, yes, boom, yes. Boom, boom, boom. You have it. Yeah. You're controlling where the ball goes. And you're controlling the pace. And the and rhythm and the cadence. Yeah. And I agree and, with Harry. She was not only a controlling witness, but she was the rare witness who's better on cross-examination than she was on direct. Because on direct, she meandered. She had her own objective. She wanted to tell her lived right. truth, which doesn't fit neatly into Mershon's rules. But here but she on has something cross, to push against. Correct. I want to just, I want to, that point you made, because I do, you, you, you said earlier today when we played you, I thought that the nuts and sluts defense, which is a reference to a famous line by David Brock, just so people know, yeah. when he was attacking Anita Hill. It was called the real Anita Hill, and it was an attempt to be like this woman when she came forward with her allegations against Clarence Thomas. This woman cannot be trusted, and he had famously wrote a line, a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty. That was how he described her. Um, so j just to put the context for that, because we played in the intro. So here is, uh, necklace about talking to Stormy Daniels. I want to get your reaction to this moment because it jumped out to me. You've acted and had sex in over 200 porn movies, right? 
150-ish, yes. And there are naked men and naked women having sex, including yourself in those movies, right? And But according to you, seeing a man sitting on a bed in a t-shirt and boxer shorts was so upsetting, you got lightheaded. Blood left your hand and feet and you almost fainted, right? Stormy. Yes, when you are not expecting a man twice your age to be in their underwear. I've seen my husband naked almost every day. If I came out of the bathroom and it was not my husband, it was Mr. Trump on the bed, I would probably have the same reaction. I was like, well, that's pretty well said. And what, what did you think of this line of inquiry, which is, you're a porn star. How could you be upset a man's trying to have sex with you? Well, it was even more offensive than that because it was, you're a porn star. How dare you think that you have the right to consent? Was right, to say it, no. Right. Correct. How it came across to me is because of what you do for your line of work, you must have a sign around your neck that basically says, open to all. And Stormy Daniels is very clear. I might do that for a living, but I choose when I do it for a living and how and when, right? Not to do it with a 60-year-old man who I found repugnant and who was looming over me in a way that felt like an imbalance of power that I wasn't into. But just notice, when they're even talking about that, Nichols is essentially conceding that she's got to make it seem like the whole thing is fantasy. They never had sex at all. So, But she's asking about details of what she said and what she you know, didn't say. It was very scattershot, and the, the, you know, she led it with her chin a lot, and, you, and she received what happens when you lead it with your chin. Grasa Stormy. Uh, th this was also uh, just one more thing, because th this, I think, relates to the hearing, right? Right. Which was the motion, once again, motion to dismiss. They had a motion right. to dismiss on Tuesday. It was denied. So the motion to dismiss here was basically this was all wildly prejudicial. Right. It was outside the bounds. Um, and my understanding of that was that part of the defense by Mersh, part of the ruling by Mershon is, no, this stuff stays in because you said it didn't happen. Correct. Right? So here's, I want to come to that in a second. But first, here's just... Um, this, I think, is from the first day, but just to, to the line yeah. of questioning, which is you made it up. This was your career of over 20 years, writing, acting, directing sex films, right? Yes. So you have a lot of experience in making phony stories about sex appear to be real, right? Wow. I'm, that's not how I would put it. The sex in the films, it's very much real, just like what happened to me in that room. Mm -hmm. Necklace. All right. But you're making fictionalized stories about sex. You write these stories. Stormy Daniels, no, the sex is real. The character names might be different. The sex is very real. That's why it's pornography. Right. <laughs> Which yeah. I thought was uh, such uh, a uh, funny line. Yeah. But can I tell you yeah. what's not funny about that? First of all, that happened today. And right. the oh, that did like, happen today. Okay. The so room it was, was like still. What I got out of that is the phrase, what happened to me. She allowed her, again, to control the narrative and make it about, this is something traumatic that happened to me, not this thing that I right. participated in willingly, I thought that was really impactful. And just the, the turn of phrase there, to you me. know, just what, just like what happened to me in that room. So when we get to the the, the mistrial, yeah. how, just first of all, how does that actually physically happen? Is that a sidebar? Is the jury still no? No. So no. it's that. And first of all. You know, in an average trial day, two or three things happen. I think today was like five or six. It was eventful. And that was one of them. You think normally an argument at the end of the day will be academic, low key. Merchan eviscerated them, both Blanche and Necklace. And I think that's why he would, Trump was so upset. But the jury left and they had, you know, an hour. Stop right there. Okay. Oh, this is a perfect place. <laughs> um, why don't you stick around? We're going to uh, talk about what happened yeah. it, when Judge Bershon eviscerated them yeah. at that hearing right after this break. Don't go anywhere. But we begin tonight with Donald Trump's need for vengeance, which has been a fundamental, th which has been fundamental to the man as his, which has been as fundamental to the man as his orange hue. He has promised to imprison President Biden. He savaged the women who have accused him of sexual abuse and impropriety. And he has humiliated his political opponents. There's a reason he's a bully, and that's because Trump is a dogmatic believer in retaliation. How do we know? Because he says it all the time. In fact, it was a point that the prosecution has made multiple times in court, as recently as this morning when yet another one of Trump's book publishers read excerpts from his book, where Trump talked about how he valued loyalty above everything else, punished disloyal people, and espoused this motto, when somebody screws you, get them back in spades. His obsession with payback was on display today in Judge Juan Marchand's courtroom, where it was clear that Stormy Daniels was about to go through some things, because Ms. Daniels, had the temerity to tell the world 
what she really thought about her sexual encounter with the C-list celebrity, which was the very thing that he and his campaign did not want the world to hear before the 2016 election. Today, he unleashed his lone female lawyer, Susan Necklace, to savage Daniel's credibility by suggesting that she really was just another money-grubbing sexual deviant motivated by fame, greed, and vengeance. First up, Necklace tried to show the jury that Stormy was greedy, asking, you wanted something to show for your experience, Stormy Daniels. Yes, I wanted the truth to be printed with a paper trail of some sort, whether it was an interview, a video, or money, that I was telling the truth to protect me. Susan Necklace, you wanted money, right? Stormy Daniels, I wanted the truth to come out. Necklace kept going, telling Daniels, quote, the better alternative was for you to make money, right? Stormy Daniels responded, the better alternative was to get my story protected with a paper trail so my family didn't get hurt if the story was out. Then Necklace wanted to show the jury that Daniels was motivated by anger. Necklace, isn't it correct you told him another motivation to go public was your anger about Trump's newfound opposition to abortion and gay marriage? Stormy Daniels, I don't remember saying that. Was he opposed to abortion? I don't know. When that didn't really work, Necklace went for the kill, slut-shaming Stormy Daniels, asking her, quote, so you have a lot of experience in making phony stories about sex appear to be real, right? Stormy Daniels, that's not how I would put it. The sex in the films is very much real, just like what happened to me in that room. This line of questioning went on for hours. And to many witnessing the cross-examination, it felt tedious, confusing, and downright vindictive. However, today, Ms. Daniels seemed composed and seemingly unflappable, even when Necklace implied that even though she got a lot of money for her deal with Cohen, she wanted the world to know she had sex with Trump. Daniels simply responded by saying, no, nobody would ever want to publicly say that. I wanted to publicly defend myself after people attacked me after Michael Cohen told about the story. In the face of the Trump defense assault, she kept returning to her truth, though after hours on the stand, Daniels began to crack. Her voice was shaking during an exchange with Necklace, who was asking her about nasty tweets she received and why she responded to them. Necklace was trying to imply that Daniels wasn't that, fe wasn't that fearful for her life or the situation since she was responding to the barrage of hate she was receiving after her story went public. On the verge of tears, Daniels pushed back telling Necklace, when somebody attacks me, I'm going to defend myself, which is ironic given that that's Trump's motto. Necklace spent the majority of her cross-examination fixated on undermining the veracity of the supposed sexual encounter, which is not the actual alleged crime. Necklace's attacks were even more jarring when juxtaposed to her treatment of the prosecution's last witness of the day, Madeleine Westerhout, Westerhout, Trump's personal secretary. Westerhout was fired when she told a bunch of reporters that she was closer to Trump than his daughters and that Trump didn't like being photographed with Tiffany Trump because he thought she was overweight. The reason why Necklace treated Westerhout with kid gloves was because she, as Trump's gatekeeper, witnessed Donald Trump's hands-on approach to his personal business while in the White House, including payments to Michael Cohen, which happens to be central to the alleged crime. Joining me now is Suzanne Craig, investigative reporter for The New York Times and an MSNBC contributor. Paul Butler, former federal prosecutor, Georgetown law professor and MSNBC legal analyst. And Claire McCaskill, former senator, MSNBC political analyst and co-host of MSNBC's How to Win 2024 podcast. I will start with you, Suzanne, because it did feel like today was Susan Necklace's, you know, kind of nadir um, of, of the cruelty that Donald Trump obviously demanded that she um, throw at uh, this witness. <laughs> She's not on trial, but you would think. What did, it, what did it look like in the courtroom? Was it uncomfortable for the jurors? I don't know how the jurors felt. I know I felt very uncomfortable. I mean, it kept building and building. And there's a point where you were both Okay, let's move along. And where are you going with this? But it, it was hard to listen to. I mean, it was it felt like something that might have happened 30, 30 years ago. I mean, not today. I mean, they were shaming a sex worker and made it feel like that. 
over and over again. I mean, it was just question after question about what, you know, what she did and, and calling her a sex worker, just things like that. And I was surprised it went on as long as it did. But the other thing that I was impressed with today um, was Stormy Daniels herself, because she rose to the moment today. I, she, she gave as good as she got. Susan Necklace was coming at her hard for hours. And she, I thought, one of the most effective things she did, first of all, she was just cool. There was no, she wasn't elevating her voice on responses. She was firm. But she would be asked questions by Susan Necklace. I mean, one of them was just, she said, Susan Necklace said to her, um, have you said um, that you want to be instrumental in putting Donald Trump in jail? Mm -hmm. And Stormy Daniels was like, I didn't say that. Where did I say that? And she would force Susan Necklace to go find the quote that multiple times Susan Necklace couldn't find because Stormy Daniels actually didn't say that. She may have said something similar to that, but not even close. And yeah. this went back and forth at the badgering. I understand that they need to have a narrative and they're trying to make her out as an opportunist who profited from this and that Donald Trump is a victim. But I was just surprised at the lengths they went today to shame her on the stand. It was kind of the not even just the st sex stuff. It was the nuts and sluts. They were, you know, they called they were basically calling her crazy at one point for other things that had happened happened in her life. Yeah. Uh, and just to the, the one that you were just talking about, uh, Suzanne, I'm going to put yeah. that right back up. Uh, ne necklace. Well, isn't it a fact that you ca ca keep posting on social media how you're going to be instrumental in putting uh, President Trump in jail? Show me where I said this is right. where she was like a better lawyer than Necklace. I'll be instrumental in putting President Trump in jail. Necklace. All right. If we could show the witness J43, please, just for the witness and parties. Do you recognize that as your post? N uh, Stormy Daniels. Yes. Necklace. And uh, Daniels, and I don't see the word instrumental or jail. And we actually have the tweet. We can just put that up and show. Yeah. Indeed, she said um, somebody tweeted at her calling her a human toilet. And she responded exactly, making me the best person to flush the orange turd down. Um, and let you me know why she said you. that? She, yeah. was, she was sort of having a pun with the toilet. Yeah. She said, if somebody's going to come after me with that, then I'm going to come back with this. And yeah. she meant nothing of what Susan Necklace had insinuated. But if, if another, another person on that stand may have just agreed just to move it along or was nervous. But Stormy Daniels was holding her ground for the entire time she was up against Susan Necklace today. Uh, let me let me do play another one or read another one. Yeah. This is Susan Necklace. Um, and, and I want to go to you on this, Claire, because you are a former prosecutor as well as being a former United States senator. Um, is, this is necklace, Susan Necklace claiming that Story Daniels was selling herself, uh, a very choice uh, way of, of putting it. Uh, and she says this, Necklace, and you were selling yourself to people who hated President Trump as somebody who could get President Trump indicted, right? Stormy Daniels, I was not selling myself to anyone. I was performing at clubs, and whoever wanted to pay admission, it was not geared toward people only who in who hated somebody. Um, these were strip club patrons who had seen me dance. They were fans of my work. A lot of them uh, had known me from 10 years before. It is difficult to cross-examine a woman, I can imagine, Claire. And normally a woman is chosen to do it. That doesn't seem atypical to me. I'm not a lawyer, but that seems logical. But it seems to me that uh, Ms. Necklace's job today was to be as nasty as possible. How does that advance the defense? It doesn't. But the, the, she had a problem. This defense lawyer had a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. The problem is Donald Trump is requiring their lawyers to present a defense that the sex never happened, that this was all made up, this, that, that none of this is true. Now, imagine how different this would be if, if Necklace was trying to establish that this witness knew nothing about whether Donald Trump had anything to do with actually writing the checks for the hush payments, if this witness knew anything about whether or not it, if they were recorded properly on his books or not. That's what this case is about. But th they are handcuffed because Trump is requiring them to prevent a, present a defense that he's the perfect family man, that the sex never happened. And that's why it was so ludicrous they asked for a mistrial. Of course, the prosecution is going to establish that the sex happened because Donald Trump, through his lawyers in opening statement, said it didn't. And that becomes a crucial part of the case. This lawyer had a very hard job. She had to make this woman look like a greedy, sleazy liar. And there's corroboration that the sex happened. The details that she's given have been wholly consistent. A little things vary, but as Paul will tell you, 
that's very common when a witness tells a story over and over and over again. The yeah. essence of her story has remained identical from the beginning, and the jury sensed that. I think yeah. this defense lawyer was required to go further than she knew she should by none other than Donald Trump, and I think she did damage to Donald Trump today. Joining me now are Duncan Levin, former assistant U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of New York, and Christy Greenberg, former federal prosecutor who served for over a decade in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. Thank you for both for being here. Um, I was flabbergasted. Christy, I believe you were down there today, but I was, yes. I was she says, with a <laughs> resigned, in a resigned fashion. Um, I was flabbergasted that they would make, they would really entreat Stormy Daniels to revisit the sort of sleazy moments in the hotel and then say, but we need a mistrial because this information has been too prejudicial. Right. The hypocrisy of yes. it. I mean, and, and, you know, this is what Judge Mershon was saying when he denied that mistrial motion of, hey, in your defense, you opened the door. You said she was a liar and you said this never happened. And yet then they go into questioning uh, you know, the, and the state says, well, OK, now we have to go into details because that lends her story credibility. And then on cross, rather than, you know, maybe stay away from that to kind of preserve this issue from appeal uh, in saying maybe this is too prejudicial. Instead, they dove right in yeah. and they were getting into it. And again, if you're if your argument is it never happened, I'm not sure why they were pointing out so many details about whether in this situation she would have consented or not. Like it made no sense. It, it was not really driving to a point that there were inconsistencies. The only inconsistency they kept pointing to was, I mean, it was it felt like forever about whether or not he fed her dinner yes i want to and i do <laughs> want to get to some of the belabored point and there were a number of very belabored moments in yes. this in this trial today but but the hypocrisy it, even to the casual observer seemed remarkable i i wonder though as we as we sort of like joke about the hypocrisy or not joke about it but in highlight it how much of a threat a mistrial really is? I mean, the, the fact that Karen McDougal is not testifying, Duncan, do you see that as evidence that the prosecution is hesitant to get into more sexual allegations vis-a-vis -vis Donald Trump as potential grounds for calling again for a mistrial. Well, I think the judge really called it out because he said, I've been objecting to this testimony as it's been coming in myself in order to give Trump a fair trial. And I shouldn't have to do that. You're not doing your job. You have let all this stuff. And there was stuff that came in, you know, much like Donald Trump is an uncontrollable client. Stormy Daniels was an uncontrollable witness for the DA's office. She was offering so much that at some point the judge said, why don't you go talk to Ms. Daniels yeah. and have her stop just answer the question that's being posed. And so he said, I've been objecting to things myself. You've let all of this in. There were some details about Mr. Trump having sex without a condom, things that should not have come Thank into that trial. Thank you for repeating that, Duncan. Well, I know it's a family show. Yeah. But I, that stuff does not need to come in to this trial. It is it is prejudicial. And the fact is that um, I, if, if Mr. Trump is convicted, you can guarantee that this is going to be part of his appeal. He's going to say, I had ineffective assistance of counsel. They didn't do anything while she was getting all of this in front of the jury. This is going to be the basis for his appeal. Yeah, well, I mean, and the judge pointed it out again today, kind of like, hey, defense, do your job. Object to more things. I'm, I'm basically playing your role. Is that the strategy to get this thrown out on appeal? But in, you have to object in order to preserve the issue for mm. appeal. So it, there is no strategy to not objecting. They needed to object. They didn't do it. They were sitting on their hands. But then the strategy was on cross to actually go into all these details to kind of dirty her up and say, you just shouldn't believe anything, she says, because she's a porn star. And a porn star in this situation, being in a hotel room with Donald Trump, couldn't feel uncomfortable, couldn't feel awkward. Right. Right. She because she was a porn star. have those feelings right. because she's a porn star. And just going back to the jury, this is a jury that is a Manhattan jury, yeah. a very highly educated jury. They're, you know, their jobs are mostly, I think most of them are college educated. They have jobs in finance, in law, in engineering. I mean, this is not a jury and, and they're split. There's about seven, there's seven men, five women, uh, you know, split between married and single. But you have to figure like this is not necessarily the jury where that is going to play where, where it, and it was just the tone. She was not only, when Susan Necklace was doing the questioning, it was not only that 
the words were insulting and they were, but it was this kind of mocking tone that yeah. she used. And it was just, I mean, it was really offensive to listen to and it was unnecessary. And I, and I feel like, again, that was my feeling sitting there, but I have to think that a Manhattan jury that's that makeup would feel that way too. Yeah. I mean, how much that their strategy was to shame Stormy Daniels for her career and suggest that she could possibly, there's no way she could have been traumatized, I guess is the word, or, or caught off guard by Donald Trump sitting there in his boxer shorts. Do you think it all made her a more sympathetic witness? A hundred percent. And, and remember that at the end of the day, um, it really solidified what came out on the direct examination, which is that Trump was almost like a predator. You know, he, there's this testimony in direct examination that he's sitting there in his hotel suite in his silk pajamas, almost like he's Hugh Hefner. Her hands are shaking as she's putting on her gold heel shoes after their sexual encounter. That was very credible, real stuff that portrayed him in a terrible light. And their cross-examination today almost solidified it as the attack dogs going after this woman who's um, been in this situation. And um, Stormy Daniels, remember, is a witness that the DA's office did not need to call. Right. They took a risk. And I think tonight they're celebrating the risk that they took in calling her. Um, but they didn't really need to call her because arguably they've already, at this point in the trial, established the elements of the crime. They've established the false business records. They've established the intent to defraud the voters. They've established the intent to conceal this conspiracy between David Pecker and the National Enquirer and Michael Cohn and Donald Trump. They've established all of this. And so the reason they called her is that it gives voice to this horrific story that Trump was so desperate not to come out. Right on the heels of that Access Hollywood tape, he found out, the Trump campaign found out, that these two women, Karen McDougal and Stormy Daniels, were about to sell this story. Yeah. Well, the jury got to hear this week what that story was, and it was terrible. And now they viscerally can see what this story is. And that's why they called her. But it was a risk because she's a witness who has baggage. She she is subject to this kind of cross-examination. They, I think the defense took the bait fell right into the trap and really just made themselves look terrible and they bolstered her credibility. Well, and they went after her on these d details which you alluded to earlier, Christy, about whether or not she ate dinner with Donald Trump in his hotel room, whether or not she took a car to the hotel. I mean, I guess the idea was to poke holes in her recollection, but these were such small details that seemed so meaningless compared to the broader narrative she was telling. I mean, what did you make of those exchanges? First, I didn't feel like they actually pointed to any inconsistencies. The way that she described it was, yeah, I said I met with him at dinner time. I never said we ate anything. I, I was starving. Um, and, and these were shorter interviews, and she didn't tell every detail in the interviews that she had. And I, I, they didn't point to anything where she had really said something that was contradictory. That was one. And then two, as you said, these are small details, and this happened 20 years ago. So you expect witnesses. And I mean, Duncan, I'm sure you've seen that. Like we've both seen when you meet with witnesses, sometimes recollections fade as to things that are, you know, not the key details. But on the key details, she has been, been consistent. consistent. So, uh, again, this was really not effective. And the other thing is, again, they opened the door by calling her a liar in the opening. And so when you do that, yeah, you're, then the jury would want to hear from her about what happened. And so her going through the story, again, that was a defense tactical error. But do I think that will lead to a mistrial um, or, or an appellate issue? Not necessarily. I mean, these are retained lawyers. These are very good lawyers with strong reputations. I don't think it will get that far, but they have definitely been sitting on their hands and not making very good strategic decisions during this trial. I got to talk about not good strategic decisions. Um, today, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth on this gag order. Um, Trump's team asked Judge Mershon to amend the gag order to allow the president to respond to Stormy Daniels. Mershon said no. Earlier, a few hours ago, Stormy Daniels tweeted, real men respond to testimony by being sworn in and taking the stand in court. Oh, wait, never mind. Is that what it what's what, Duncan? I think, look, there's a problem in the fact that the witnesses are not subject to this gag order. And we've been seeing tweets from Michael Cohen yeah. um, attacking uh, Mr. Trump as well. And so uh, I, I think there is a bit of a, a disconnect between the fact that he can't say anything and that they, the witnesses can. But that being said, there is a long history here of Mr. Trump inciting violence against not only the witnesses, but the DA's office, the members of the DA's office staff, the judge, the family. 
family. There is a real background here. There's a reason that this gag order exists. And um, I think that at the end of the day, um, he's right not to modify the gag order because there are more witnesses coming. And if you lift the gag order right now, um, these witnesses who are coming up are going to know that right the minute they're off the stand, right. they're going to be subject to all these attacks. It cannot stand, um, given the history of, of these these violent attacks on people. And, and I think the judge is right to just keep it in place and keep it as it is. Well, but maybe Stormy Daniels don't po poke the bear on Twitter. Just yeah. to, I mean, just to lay, lay person's advice there.